The last blind spot I wanted to focus on was great expectations. What I'm effectively talking about is pretty much around the licence to operate. And if you remember, 89% of, um, of the consumers believe a company needs to be looking after the public good as well. In other words, more than the legal requirement. Well, 84% of executives believe that business does actually have a broader contract with society. That's, so they basically agree. Now, the, the worrying thing for them is, even now that HIH and Enron are out of the way and behind us, we're still seeing that trust in business is falling. That's an issue for business that they need to grapple with because both consumers and they themselves say, actually, this is really important. I can give you a lot of um, quotes on this. Um, you probably expected one from Mike Hawker from IAG, but you may not have expected one from Don Argus at BHP and Michael Porter as well. They all regard this as an important issue. And if I read um, Don Argus's comment, in increased community expectations in the private sector and an increasing expectation that corporations will be accountable to a wide range of stakeholders, now we see the communities with which we work, the media, the NGOs, non-government organisations, playing a role in determining our licence to operate. You can look at the companies, some who get it wrong. Um, you remember the lead paint in um, the Chinese toy manufacturer. For Mattel um, in the US, the direct cost of recalling about 20 million products was about 5% of earnings. When you add on the costs of mucking around with the supply chain, some countries continuing to restrict importation of their goods, um, and the extra costs of putting in place quality systems and a corporate social responsibility program, it's more like 10 or 15% of profits from something that you might have originally thought was fairly modest in scale. Um, you can think about misreading community sentiment. In terms of getting it right, you can think about carbon offsets, Virgin Blue in particular, been very public about offsetting its own staff and the offer it provides to customers. Retiree needs, just in the, the nature of what they do in terms of if they do a good job of supporting retirees, those companies have some significant potential I know was talked about yesterday. In terms of running risks, um, quality of childcare is interesting with ABC Learning. We, wrote, we spoke with Eddie Groves um, and others in the organisation a couple of years ago. One of our big issues was the lack of disclosure of quality of childcare. The more recent um, big price fall would not have been as big if the company had been better at disclosure generally. Um, so these things are an issue. You can think about mining in South Africa, dealing with AIDS and so on. And, and if you want to look at some very simple measures of, or fairly naive measures, of whether these companies outperform, on our own analysis, you see about a 2% pickup just, just by naively comparing the best companies against the worst companies over about um, six or seven years. How do you read the treasure map? A whole lot of things you can look at. We don't have time to spend... Um, on them, but it requires a bit of thinking. It's not quite as obvious as you first think. You can think of BHP and Octeti. They arguably did quite a poor job in terms of dealing with the risks ahead of time and, and immediately following the, um, their problems there. But they, they began to regroup and rethink and did a relatively good job in a difficult situation at the end. It's interesting watching Santos now and the big uh, mudslides uh, at Banja and how they're dealing with that. And if I was to finish with an... Um, with an example of a company that is particularly good in this area in terms of a licence to operate, and in fact to the point that, that customers actually beg to have them come to the area, the classic example would have to be, or one of the classic examples would have to be Bendigo Bank, um, where the community banking is one of the reasons behind their, their sort of leading staff and community satisfaction. So let me sum up. Um, what is the opportunity? Well, I guess my point has been blind spots exist. We have a different view by companies and market wisdom, and the question is, which one is right? I, I think the evidence I've suggested to you tends to very much support that company management are much more on the ball here than market wisdom. So what that means is there is a blind spot in market wisdom, if you believe that. Why do we have these blind spots? I'll give you four reasons. I think investors are actually unclear where to look for value, that intangibles is now the centre of investor value. Secondly, I don't think they have the tools quite often to analyse the map. They haven't thought through the whole Quadrant 2 problem. What are the issues to look at? How much are they tied to shareholder returns? And are they measurable externally? 
they often don't have the expertise to use the tools. Um, does one size fit all with a BEC or a B finance? Well, Mark Twain said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to approach each problem as if it were a nail. And I guess we could say, if the only tool you have is a Bachelor of Finance, you tend to approach each valuation problem as if it's a cash flow statement and you only need to speak to the CFO. And lastly, investors aren't actually sure how to unlock that treasure to great effect. Now, we're different to many in the way we, we think of things. Um, the way we think of things are, things like a DCF and valuation approach like that are not dead. They still add value. But what we need to do is bring these um, learnings around the social capital into the risk premium and the growth rate in terms of getting a better valuation for the company and making better investments. So if we believe they're blind spots, if we know there are reasons why these blind spots should exist, what is the point for us as investors? Well, it's simply this. The upside of blind spots is that by understanding the social dimension of capital, they can provide an opportunity to uncover treasure, or as we call it, alpha. Thank you. Thanks, um, Thanks Michael, for a great presentation. Um, it's worth noting that uh, Michael's fund has performed in the top quartile the last five years, so it seems to be sustainable and providing alpha. We have time for about two questions. I'm sure there are some. Anyone with a question? Roving mics. While we wait for someone to put up their hand, Michael, there seems to be a giant chasm between analysts and their way of valuing company and company executives. How does that actually get resolved? You said to me on the phone the other day that uh, part of the problem is that people who become analysts, they study a Bachelor of Finance, they don't know how to understand or value people. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think, I think that's where the Mark Twain um, quote comes in, that if you don't have skills in that area, you tend to assume that that area isn't important or that it's not measurable or whatever. So it actually does require, I think, investment teams to look beyond the, the, the narrow Bachelor of Finance, Bachelor of Economics sort of starting point. They're, they're obviously very valuable. But to look at you know, psychology or look at, um, uh, in our case, people who are experts have actually been trained in environmental and social um, analysis and, and consider having them as part of the wider team. You mentioned a couple of companies that do a great job, such as ANZ and at the last one, Bendigo Bank. Who does a really appalling job? Um, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> Question this, up here. This is not the venue. <laughs> Number one. Hi, uh, Paul Lee from Hermes in London. Uh, there was a discussion at the PRI session yesterday on uh, the problem of timescales and uh, fund managers' timescales being completely different from the way these things tend to play out. How do you address that issue, Michael, in, in your team? Do you think it's a problem? Yeah, so the question there is around, um, the question there is around timescales. And I think you're referring to the fact that sometimes some of these environmental social governance risks come out in the long term um, and you don't quite know when they're going to come out. So, for example, the asbestos liability issue and how that was being addressed at Hardy's, we saw that a long time before as an issue, but you never knew when it was going to come out. Um, I guess in the reality is if it does come out in the long term, sooner or later you will get the alpha that comes from that. But there's... So there are some factors like that that are long burn. There are some factors that are, that are steady drip feeds. Things like um, having good human capital management, I think that's a steady drip feed into the positive return of a company every year. Whereas some of them are big one-off negatives. You know, the Australian Wheat Board issue. Um, they were dealing in um, a country which was, um, on our analysis, one of the, 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 the countries in the world known for being the worst in terms of transparency um, and in terms of dealing with having big risks around bribery and corruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was rated number two on some of the, the specialist surveys around that area. Yet we weren't clear that they were dealing with those risks well. Those sort of things hit maybe one year in three, but when they hit, they hit with a big negative one-off hit, whereas other things are drip feeds over, over shorter periods. And I think if you've got a mix of those in the portfolio, in the end, that adds up. Last question, Howard. Howard Rosario from West Scheme. Um, one of the things I didn't notice in your talk, Michael, was um, any reference to boards. Um, you focused on managements and you focused on operational issues, but 
Aren't boards very important in the development of social capital? And uh, also, I was wondering, uh, for me, I think it's intuitive, but is a board with a good balance of non-executive directors essential to this sensitivity to social capital and its growth and development? Um, I actually strongly agree with what you've just said. The, um, I was really, it was really just a matter of trying to leave the governance issues aside, given they're being covered elsewhere in the agenda. But yes, I think they're very key, and we also spend a fair bit of time on that. And I, further, I'd go f further to say that the mistake that I think some investors make is they think that I've got a really strongly performing company, and yet it doesn't have a very independent board. But it's really strong performing, um, and it's got some very um, aligned people involved, and I feel really pleased about that. And as a consequence, they don't necessarily get the board right and get, a, get it nice and independent. And the time when that hurts is when things begin to go wrong. And that's when you discover all the conflicts of interest, and that's when it actually comes home to roost. So I think getting the board right is often insurance for when, when times are bad. So I suspect it's a fair chance that we're going to see some board problems emerge over this year, whereas we probably didn't see it last year because the market was up and everything was going well. Very quickly, last one here. Um, Pat Ronald from the ACTU. I noticed you referred to the UN Charter of Human Rights and the um, PRI principles are also based on UN principles and they include things like the right to organise and the right to collective bargaining. Some of the companies that you've mentioned actually don't give that right to the workforce and under the industrial regime we've had um, under the previous government, people didn't have that right. And I just wondered if you can comment on um, the, those relationships and whether you think companies should give um, people that right and that will improve their performance. Yeah. Um, it's obviously a long and complicated... Well, sorry, it's, it's a long discussion with a lot of um, bits and pieces around it. But the broad, the broad sweep of it is, yes, we think that that is, that is a valuable thing. We think it also has all sorts of positive feedback loops to the company. Um, the, uh, the other thing that, that, spit, uh, that spins off your comment is, by the way, there are no perfectly sustainable companies. So one is always having to judge as to whether um, one company is doing a better job than another company, not whether... Because if we look for the perfect company, we'd never find one. Um, another thing is, it is very valuable to actually look at a whole range of... Um, I guess inputs. So the, I, I, was, I was suggesting, and it's probably not quite as black and white as this, but the, the typical analysts will largely focus on speaking to the chief financial officer. Among other things, we speak to actually heads of a number of the unions to get their views on how the companies in their industry are, um, how well they are actually dealing with their staff. So we've actually asked um, the, uh, the relevant the FSU what they think about the major banks' performance in those areas, and they've given us their comments. And, and while you never take anybody else's comments as gospel, you do want to consider them in the wider view of the company's performance. So we, we take those, those views seriously. It's a much bigger conversation, I think. Michael, like many of our speakers, has flown in, especially from Sydney for the day, so thank you for your time and your, uh, uh, your contribution. Uh, from Bridgewater is a uh, contribution also from them to the Oxfam organisation. Uh, I applaud uh, CMSF and Bridgewater, the platinum sponsor, for rather than giving bottles of wine and other such things to people who are already seriously wealthy, uh, they're, giving <laughs> they're giving donations to, uh, to Oxfam, which um, operates in 27 countries, providing urgently needed education and other things in uh, places much poorer than here. So thank you to Bridgewater and to Oxfam and to Michael.